Hey everyone, welcome back to Titans of Service Now. As always, I am your host, Robert the Duke Fedoric. It is so good to have you here. Thank you so much for your support, ladies and gentlemen. We have finally made it. Because no episode is going to give the Titans of Service Now series as much credibility as this single episode. It is my pleasure and my honor to welcome tonight's guest, the one and only Chuck Norris Tomasi. Chuck. <laughs> Thanks. No pressure on that <laughs> intro, is there? <laughs> the pressure's all on me, dude. It's like, oh, how would you like to interview the uh, face of service now on a moment's notice? Yeah, nah, sure, let's do that. I'm just a guy. I write my code one line at a time, just like everybody else. I got to use a debugger. It, there's nothing special about what I do or how I do it. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a lot of fun. Maybe it's just because I have a lot of fun doing it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I feel very lucky and very blessed to be in the position I'm in. And so thank you, everybody who is listening, watching, uh, doing what you do. Keep on doing that uh, ServiceNow development stuff and feeding the ideas. That's what I thrive on. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning is knowing you're out there doing some really cool stuff. I'm still gobsmacked that I've got you here on Titans of Service Now because there's few Titans as Titanic as Chuck. For those of us who were in the game early, Chuck was kind of like one of those personas. He had been there, done that on Service Now even 12 years ago. I don't know about that. <laughs> you did. <laughs> You're the one who's telling all the rock star stories about how cool everything was that you had done with ServiceNow, the platform at where you were. And like, I started 12 years ago. I was like, whoa, someday I'm going to be like Chuck. Well, I, I was a customer from 2008 to 2010. And that's kind of when I, I implemented ITSM. We did. So maybe my incident? years are off a bit. No, 2008 is, I, we were customer like number 205. We mm -hmm. signed in October of 2008. See, I remember weird dates like that. Like that's, that's one of my strange superpowers, I guess. It got the Innovation of the Year Award at Knowledge 10. I was a customer. Now get this, 500 attendees at Knowledge 10. <laughs> and if you were at Knowledge 19, it was what, about 20,000? Bit of a difference between in the last 10 years. Yeah, I miss Knowledge 10. I, I wanted to go really badly, but they were like, oh, we, we're, set, we're already sending our other guy maybe next year. And so Knowledge 11 was my first one. And it's just like, you know, you tell the new people, they don't believe it. Like Knowledge 11 was in a tent. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds worse than it is. Yeah. It was one of those big events tents. Like if you go to a golf outing or something, they've got those massive, huge white tents that are, you know, you can fit a thousand people in them. And we did. Yeah, it's, it's just kind of like a circus tent, an old tiny yeah, circus tent. kind of is. Was Knowledge 10 your first knowledge? Knowledge 10 was my first knowledge. That was in San Diego at the Omni. I believe we had a pre-party. There, there was pre-con training. It was just sysadmin course, though because I had an employee that was going to that. So while he was doing sysadmin training Sunday, Monday, me and my third partner, we went out and explored San Diego. So we went up to uh, Torrey Pines and we went to the USS Midway and mm. had a great old time. Then the conference really got started and met a lot of great people that are still at service now. Doug Schultz, Jared Latham, who is no longer there, but a lot of names that people would recognize probably from the demo data more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bo, Bo Ruggieri was there. You know. <laughs> Jared Bennett was there. It was it was a lot of fun, and uh, it, it was a bit of a different vibe back then. Still, a lot of the same things where you know we're, we're networking, we're doing hands-on stuff. Where the vendor hall was actually like four little card tables in the hall. There was no formal vendor space. <laughs> Man, so Knowledge Eleven must have been a huge step up. It it was. It was about twice the uh, amount of people too. I think there was a thousand or eleven hundred people at Knowledge Eleven. Yeah. So it, it grew very rapidly, and it was interesting to see. I had the opportunity to go to Knowledge Nine, but didn't make it to that one. And I would have loved to have that experience as well. So everybody's first knowledge is a wonderful thing. It's going to be very, very different this year now that it's a yeah. purely digital experience. So that's new for us creating content and delivering it. And how do we do all this stuff with the social isolation in place and whatnot? So there's a lot of stuff going on right now. Yeah, it's real. I'm really interested to see how this one shakes down. It's going to be so different from anything that, that we've done. It would have been my 10th knowledge. Uh, well, no, I mean, it is going to be my 10th knowledge. It still is. Still yeah, is. no, for sure it is. And I'm just, I'm really anxious to see how it goes down because it, it would speak to the adaptability and agility yep. to have a successful conference when like everything just blew up in their face. It was the 11th hour when the crisis struck, basically, from an event orchestration perspective. Pretty much, yes. Right? And it, so it, now the it's... The timing couldn't have been, well, the timing could have been worse. It could have been, you know, a week before. Yeah, but, uh, that's true. We do have the... Uh, 
experience, Adobe just had their online conference this past week. As we record this, I don't know when it'll be going out, but it was somewhere in that April 1st, 2nd timeframe. Uh, Okada had one later that week. So it, we're observing and watching and seeing what works and, and kind of making the tweaks. But there'll be some that'll be pre-recorded. There'll be some that'll be live. There, there's still going to be breakout sessions. What, what's too long? What's too short? A, a lot of a lot of dials to tune at this point. But we've we got the, the format laid down. Think more like watching Hulu or you Netflix or, or is Amazon Prime. We're going to have channels of content that you can tune into and tap into. So it, different experience. Some will be live. Some will be what we call Simulive where you're watching a recording, but you've got live Q&A behind the scenes. A lot of, a lot of different formats that we're going to roll out. I am slated to be the channel host for CreatorCon. So I get to do some live introductions and anything could happen at that point. Effectively the same as being on stage, like an MC. So that's, I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait. I, I kind of like in the situation, you ever read The Martian by Jonathan yes. Weir? It's Jonathan Weir, right? Uh, I should know this because I wanted to interview him for one of our podcasts. Oh, really? <laughs> and all I'm getting is movies on the internet, like <laughs> screenplay by I'm like who wrote the book Matt Damon <laughs> Matt, Matt Damon wrote the book to get off Mars he wrote the script to get off Mars. <laughs> I better write myself a rescue <laughs> it's Andy Weir sorry Andy <laughs> Um, but the whole situation kind of reminds me of The Martian. It's just like, this crisis has happened, and how are we going to get our way out of it? And then there's stuff that just happens along the way, and, and you, you roll with the punches. That's um, an interesting... I hadn't heard that before, but now that you mention it, 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 it kind of is. Yeah, and if you um, solve enough problems it's going to be successful. Yeah. Somebody uh, early on, I think it was like sales kickoff 11 or 12. It was an earlier one for me where they use the whitewater rafting analogy. Enter and deal is what they call it. Uh -huh. Once you get in that river, you deal with whatever comes at you. Yeah. You've got to, otherwise you're not going to survive. So I don't mean to paint such a dark picture about it, but it, it is interesting to see what the rapids are holding for us. And uh, I think it was Thursday, I got a, a lab assignment, said, here, go build this workshop. For, we're building a creator con workshop. Nothing exists today. There wasn't even a screenshot or a storyline or like, uh, okay. So I've been slapping that together as fast as I can. But I've done lab guides before. My wife is great at proofing them and testing them. So we're going to come up with this. So it, it'll happen. Yeah, this is where we get to prove the kind of the fiber of service now. We perceive it as being a forward-thinking, agile, talented company. This mm -hmm. is just an exquisite opportunity to prove it. The circumstances are outside their control, and we see the talent machine in place, the management machine in place, and see how it reacts yeah. to a massive curveball. And I, man, I'm just looking forward to like podcasting about that. So those of us who've been in, this, in the system a while obviously know who Chuck Tomasi is and why, but for those just entering the space, how would people know you? Well, this would be a five-part series. A five-part series. Complete history. <laughs> How would they know me? They'd know me from likely the Tech Now videos that we've been doing since 2013. It's a, a technical webinar series that we do monthly targeted to ServiceNow developers and admins uh, of all skill levels. We do a wide variety of platform topics. It might be record producers and interceptors one week. It might be script includes the next. It might be the latest platform features in Orlando. So we're always trying to make sure that your saw is sharp. We've got arrows in your quiver or whatever metaphor you want to use just to keep you aware, enabled, and and moving forward with the platform. Because when it comes down to it at the end of the day, the developers are the ones that have to do the work to implement those solutions. And, and that's what I get passionate about. And having been doing software development for over 30 years, it really is a different mindset on ServiceNow because you don't have to start from the beginning with, let's set up a SQL server and a VM. And it's like, let's just jump in and start working on the data model to get the basic guts of our the, the framework of our app built out. So it's fun. It frankly is fun. I'm working on more than one home project right now on ServiceNow that has nothing to do with work. <laughs> Of all the contributions you've made to the community over the years, what's one of the ones that sticks out as being kind of your favorite? The one either you most loved or the one that had the most unexpected result? The one that keeps coming up on almost a weekly basis still, this is eight or nine years ago, I wrote one called Ask Why to encourage the developers to understand why they are implementing something. It's one thing for somebody who says, hey, I need this field to turn green. or I need, it. And you can do that a thousand different ways. Are, and there's right ways and there's wrong ways. But if you don't understand why it's turning green, 
or why you need this field on a form. You are going to run into a problem that one of my predecessors had in a former lifetime where he would put anything on that somebody would walk up to his office and say, Chris, I need this on my form. And he would do it only to find out there's three other fields that do the same thing. And now nobody's got a process. Nobody's got a workflow. Nobody understands how to get data out that's meaningful. And it was really an encouragement because there are some people in this world that will blindly implement a technical solution without understanding what the business requirement is behind it. And that one, I, it, it warms my heart that people are still clicking that helpful link every once in a while going, okay, they actually read it and it's got a fair number of reads. Was it a post on community about it, building? It was it a, I think it was a blog post on the community from 2012. Wow. I'm going to have to go. Oh, let's go find that. Yeah, it's just called Ask Why. It's the first I've heard of it. When I think about the content that, that you've made that has had big impact, I'm, there, there's one that's more recent that really sticks out in my mind, and it was the Learn JavaScript on ServiceNow course. The video series? Yeah. Yeah, that was released um, mid-July of 2019. Yeah, I that mean, was... it's recent, but I, like that that's huge. That's taken been... off. I can't, yeah. it, it's so far overdue because when we started a scripting course about 2011, mm-hmm. 12, the prerequisite was... You you already know JavaScript. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I said, where are they going to get this from? Well, they go, oh, well, you go to W3 schools or Code Academy or you, know, you can, you yes, you can learn JavaScript, but it's not. It doesn't have the ServiceNow finesse in it. Yeah. Uh, well, you, know, then back you, then, you, you don't know the, the objects, right? That ServiceNow gives right. you that, that. And a lot of that, I didn't want to step on the toes of our training department. They're wonderful people. Uh, you know, we've got IP that we have to protect. But I wanted to get somebody set up. I wanted to answer the question when I go to the developer meetups and somebody says, uh, yesterday I was an admin. Then this morning, two developers just left. Now I'm a developer. Where mm-hmm. do I get started? Yeah, I get it. That I wanted every Those, week. How do yeah. I become a developer quickly? And I say, don't ask me. I didn't become a developer quickly. Everything I learned about <laughs> <laughs> everything I learned about JavaScript, I learned by doing it on Service Now over the course of 12 years. And and now here I am. And I'm not even you know you compare me to like a James Neal or any of the Dev MVPs. Sometimes I feel like an ant crawling on the pages of a NASA rocket launch manual. Everybody knows something different. They all have a different perspective. They all have different experiences. And that's what I love. I don't claim to know everything. The platform is too darn big for any one person to know that. So I try to focus my attentions on integrations and custom applications and the general platform concepts and, and, and give those back. The JavaScript thing was actually a labor of love. That was nowhere in my job charter. I just said, this is a need that needs to be filled. Did it in my free time. Apologize. It was a couple of years overdue, but in doing so, I was able to structure it a little bit better. I, I was thinking about originally releasing it on Udemy or Lynda.com mm-hmm. or LinkedIn Learning, and I said, "Nah, yeah, this is this is free and open. Let's just not no barrier to enter it. It's on the um, it's now developer program YouTube channel. So if you look for service now developer program, uh, you can find it there. We'll put a link to it in the video description. Thank you for sure. Yeah. And again, for all those asking me, how do I become a developer quickly? Like, first of all, consume that material and then we'll talk. And it, it will take you from everything, not to toot the own horn, but everything from basic syntax, understanding what variables are, what's a good variable, what's a bad variable. It gets into condition statements and looping structures and takes you quite literally, by the time you're done, you'll be writing a scripted REST API. And you're like, what? And passing objects back and forth. And and you can use these short bite snippets. It's 54 parts. There's a few exercises along the way to test your knowledge. And I, I, I structured it like a typical online training course and just went, hey, have fun with it. Put your answer in the comment or email me or whatever. Uh, so it was it was a lot of fun to do. It was a good exercise. And it, it, it uh, taught me a few things about audio video production in that format as well. So the problem is now everybody says, can you do one on integrations? Can you do one on a service portal? Can you do one on... <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to if there were about six more of me. Thanks again for doing that, by the way. Oh, you're very welcome. One thing I always preach in the industry is like when people are trying to come up in the ServiceNow space or trying to be bigger in the ServiceNow space, I always tell them to embrace the non-ServiceNow aspect of whatever it is they do because some of the most interesting ServiceNow resources that I've met in my time maybe didn't come from ITSM backgrounds Mm -hmm. um, or developer backgrounds, but they did something that colored their perspective and their approach to whatever they did in the ServiceNow ecosystems. I generally deal with like admins, devs, and architects. And so one thing I try and ask everybody who comes on the show is what wildcard aspect from your life informed the way you approach what you bring to the ServiceNow community? Wow. 
That's a great question. And I'd have to say it was early in my career. We, we owned a family business. My dad was looking to a keep his nine kids busy in some way, <laughs> help offset the college costs. So we started a small business around their hobbies, just like my podcasting hobby is felt fed well into my career. They learned to scuba dive in the late sixties and started a scuba shop. And as a result, I had some small business experience starting at the tender age of about 10 years old. So if I've been, if my calculations are right, I should be able to retire about 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that turned into a scuba diving charter business. We did scuba charter operations in a little town in upper peninsula of Michigan called Munising, Michigan. And we would get store owners that would put together groups from around the Midwest and they would come up and spend a weekend with us. We would do charter shipwreck diving. And I learned so much about customer service in that role, learning how to interact with customers, who you could, who you should be dead serious with and who you could, uh, you know, tell dirty jokes to if you wanted to. It was, it was that kind of relationship building. And a lot of the, the stuff I still use, uh, that's a dirty word in my opinion, but uh, the, 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 the tools in my toolbox come from those early experiences in my teenage years. Very, very formative to how customer service should be done. That worked out very, very well when I started getting into IT in my 20s, doing system administration, taking care of Unix workstations and whatnot. But even when I was interacting with the engineers, I, I'd get told, you don't sound like a typical computer nerd because you know you know how to talk to people. I went, that, yeah, kind of that's what you need is you need to be able to interact with people, listen and, and hear what the problems are, and then you can go solve them. That, the short answer, customer service from doing scuba charters. <laughs> That's a great one. And for those of you listening, do the same thing. Before you ask, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? Think about what you've done and the difference that that's going to apply to what you bring. And everybody brings something different. And it's, it, mm -hmm. for me, the highlight of, you know, 12 years of doing this is seeing those different shades, those different... It, it's almost like a recipe. You know, what are the ingredients you need to turn out that final product when it comes out of the oven. It's yes, anyone can put ingredients together, but are they the right proportions? Did you bake at the right time? We were watching a show on Netflix the other night called uh, Nailed It. Yes. Oh, my kids love that show. <laughs> so yeah. if you know the show, I, I, one episode, I probably will not watch another one. It had its moments and, you know, they're using technically the same ingredients <laughs> and following the same recipe, but they're getting a totally different result. And uh, it's laughable at times, but that's, Everybody's got a different experience. Everybody's a little bit different in the way that they mix those ingredients. You could also use a music metaphor if you want. Mm -hmm. but yeah, how you arrange the song, right? The, how right. you arrange your cover of the song. And actually, speaking of covers, one thing I like to do, like when I'm teaching people to build, I'm just like, hey, listen, if you have, if you went to school, if you've ever had a job, just think of a BS problem that you hated dealing with and then build a solution to that in service now. And that's your training exercise. And yep. you're going to have to learn about the work intake, right? How does it get there? What happens to it when it's in there? The workflow, business logic you, you want to process in the middle. And then what do you want to report off of and gauge your performance by? And then you put all the, those things together and essentially you've done a ServiceNow implementation. I often start with, especially with custom applications, I start with stuff that's on my desktop. What are my problems that I'm trying to solve? Because I know the requirements, I know how to, and I'll run into challenges. Okay, well, how do I solve this? And then you got to reach out for help and say, well, what's the answer here? Well, who, who can I talk to? Who can I reach out to? And by the end of that experience, I've got not only my application that solves my needs, but I've got a whole bunch of new skills that I can use for that. And of course, me being me, I turn around and share them on a video. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all thankful for it being who you are and how long you've been in the game, you must have seen so, so much of the platform. What part of the platform do you feel most aligned with? Uh, it, it's changed over the years. I, I, I think the first oh wow moment I had was when I was a customer watching our first demo and I, I saw a record producer. Like, wow, simplified forms that ask pertinent, real human questions and you get a record as an output. That was Any amazing. Record. Yeah. yeah, any record, any table. It's like, you know, I think the original one was the incident one. It says, what is the urgency of this request? Instead of just saying urgency. And you like, wow, that's pretty freaking awesome. Three questions and you've got an incident. They don't need to see this form that looks like an IRS <laughs> income tax form on the back end if you don't want them to. Uh, then I learned about 
things like table extensions. And that was an oh wow moment. <laughs> wow, you could take this task table and pretty much bake any process that has assignments and workflows and states and priorities. Like they all share the same thing and you get a rolled up report of my work. That's pretty amazing. You know, so I, I get excited about different things along the journey. Service portal is is still an exciting piece for me. Flow designer is is an integration hub are becoming the lead horses lately. I'm sure when we get more tools and uh, capabilities for developers around the workspace and the whole now experience that was introduced in Orlando, uh, that's going to have some fun aspects of it as well. Uh, mobile, the the new mobile platform has been uh, some good. I, I don't want to this the wrong way, but challenges, good challenges. As, you know, there's good stress and there's bad stress. This is good stress that you know. Hey, go build this on the the mobile platform. Far out. You know, that that sounds fun. So there's there's a lot of it that uh, it kind of ebbs and flows and goes. It kind of depends on what the what the recent project is. I feel like Flow Designer really had a breakout year last year. When it first came out, there was still too much temptation just to keep using legacy workflow. Right. And not enough people knew enough about it. And yeah, I think it was it was a lot more advanced than it was intended to be. Well, I mean, when it was first released, it was very much that whole citizen developer vibe. Yeah. And there is certainly elements of it that lend itself very well to that citizen developer experience. But I feel like they got the right people constantly teaching the ecosystem about it, like Andrew Barnes and the live coding happy hour and stuff. And I feel like 2019, like way at the beginning, but 2019 no. was the year where I don't think about legacy workflow anymore. I think my, I my first instinct is flow designer. And and the, 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 the key for me was to stop thinking of flow designer as a new version of workflow. It's actually like super duper steroid business rules is really what it is. Yeah, you've got an yeah. action that's a trigger. I mean, you've got a trigger that has, whether it's the record was created or updated or scheduled, it's a scheduled job mm -hmm. replacement as well. Uh, it You can do email triggers. Uh, I'm waiting for the one that triggers off of REST APIs. So you can have <laughs> coming REST that triggers a flow. I know you can do it from script and there's the flow API, but I want a cleaner version of that. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some way to go. And they recognize that on the roadmap. One of the fun things about my job is I get a little bit of insight of what's coming in the next year or so. There's, there's some good stuff coming. And if you recognize any, please, please reach out to me and say, Hey Chuck, I'd like better date manipulations. Cause when I'm in the condition builder and I put a date field in there, I can't say, you know, <laughs> data pill is greater than, uh, there's no calendar picker on this thing. Oh, <laughs> I dang. <laughs> I, I just discovered that yesterday. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> so you know, I'm writing a custom action to do basic stuff like beginning of next month. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> so how, actually speaking of that, how would people reach out to you? They can reach me, chuck.tomasi at servicenow.com. There you go, folks. T-O-M-A-S-I. Or LinkedIn. I think half the population gets a hold of me on LinkedIn first. Forget an open door policy. There is no door. Chuck just gave... <laughs> this yawning maw access to Chuck Tomasi. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. Bring it on. We usually end these with a little bit forward thinking. And I know the crisis kind of puts a, a long shadow over what we think about in the future. But if we could just kind of see even past the COVID-19 crisis, what are you mm -hmm. most looking forward to in the ServiceNow ecosystem? Well, you mentioned the COVID thing. And, and I am fully embracing the opportunities that this opens up. A quick example is our, our developer meetups have gone virtual for the time being, and, and some may continue to do so. It allows me to attend Thursday night in Atlanta and next Tuesday in Oslo without flying all over the world. Not quite the same experience, but I'm able to attend more of those. So it, and, and I opened my eyes going, that wasn't possible you know, pre COVID stuff. So you know, keep your eyes open for those opportunities. What am I most excited about in the ServiceNow ecosystem? Yeah, or more, the product. Seeing more of what customers are doing. I really, really am eager to get some of this no-code, low-code stuff into the rest of the customer organizations so that their power users and their process owners start building with Guided App Creator or what's coming next is called Creator Studio. And, and being able to build the bones of those applications and then freeing up the developers to do what developers love to do. And that's write code for complex components that they can put into the workspace, integrations that require scripting. So you're building integration hub spokes, service portal widgets. You know, that's, I, I am still a developer inside of the heart of me is a computer scientist. 
And it beats loud and proud because I get out of bed in the morning to write some pretty complex stuff, not to put checkboxes on forms, not to write reports. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's not what excites me. And I know what excites the rest of you too. It's like, let's, let's add value to what people have already built and, and having organizations recognize a service now as a platform. That's a big hurdle. We haven't quite knocked down yet. And this COVID stuff, the emergency apps that we put out are helping to open people's eyes to that. Go, wow. They turn those, those things around in days. Yeah. I'm just going to take a quick tangent there. Cause last week we had kind of a, didn't Kim Kardashian tweet something about LA? Yeah. De- like deployed, yeah. deployed a COVID response app on service now. And she basically called it out. And so now we've got like kind of celebrity visibility, but like, I can't stop thinking about it, Chuck. How does a company get to the point where they can get smacked in the face by a big, huge curveball like COVID and deploy an application on ServiceNow in response to it in the time that they did. Because like a lot of us struggle with getting getting an organization to think big with ServiceNow, right? And yeah. so it's, it's just this question that burns in my mind. What is the secret sauce? What is the formula for getting an organization that can be that agile and that confident in the ServiceNow platform to respond to something. This is like, this got nothing to do with ITSM, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But a global business curveball and start utilizing ServiceNow as the as the response mechanism to that. I have two words. <laughs> Bill McDermott. <laughs> he is a freaking genius when it comes to this kind of stuff. Granted, some of it's a little aggressive for some people's taste. I mean, he announced it internally on March 9th. The most of the apps that you see didn't exist, and we turned them around and got the, the, the core apps out there within a few days. But he's the one who saw this as, wow, what an opportunity to, A, help the community. That's first and foremost what it was. Let's help customers. It's you know, the world of work, work better for people. It's just let's make the world better is what it should be shortened up to be. Granted, I'm, <laughs> I'm not being endorsed by our marketing or co- corporate communications people on this one. So uh, it, that's that's really what it is first. And I it, I don't mean to sound so markety and rah, 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 but that was brilliant to say, let's solve problems. And then secondary is hopefully customers will go, wow, that was pretty awesome. Yeah, that, that was that was Bill. I meet any criticisms of being opportunistic there with they're not charging for it. Right. We have a problem. It's a big, scary problem. I'm not ashamed to admit, you know, I fear for right now. I fear for what's down mm-hmm. the road. But here's a platform that we all love, that we all build on. And the company on a dime turned around and output some some decent applications and then just gave them away for free. Like I, 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 I like firmly reject any um, kind of claims of, of opportunism, right? It's kind of yeah. like, oh, you're gonna, you know, use this to build your brand. Uh, well, listen, we're gonna help a whole lot of people. Right. right. Yeah, I like no it to Volvo in the, what was it, the 60s or 70s when they had all those patents about safety things of airbags and crumple zones and whatnot. And they gave them away. They said, this is just too valuable not to share with the rest of the automotive industry. And, and that's, that's what came to mind first. Like, we're giving these apps away. That's awesome because it just makes the world a better place, first and foremost. Yeah. I can stick a fork in that positive note. And, um, <laughs> I'll give you the final word, Chuck. Thanks for being on the show, but I'll give you the final word. Final word. Uh, go learn something, share something, and have some fun doing it, and you can be a hero too. Wise words. Chuck, thanks so much for joining me. It's been an honor. If you'd like to sponsor this channel's content, contact me via the email address pictured here. If you'd like to contribute to high-quality, high-frequency content, consider a donation. If not, I still appreciate your viewership. Consider hitting the like button and sharing with your network. See the description for relevant links. Thanks for watching.